So without further ado, let me introduce Reverend Dr. Jeanette Oak. Jeanette Oak joined Fuller's faculty as Associate Professor of New Testament in summer 2020. Prior to coming to Fuller, she served for five years on faculty at Azusa Pacific Seminary in Azusa, California. I wish I were in California because it's a lot warmer there than in, in Princeton, New Jersey. She studied religion and English literature at UCLA and taught high school English at LA in LA before earning her MDiv and PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary. That is no stranger to PTS. Her research interests include First Peter, the letters of John, and the formation of early Christian identity with an emphasis on Asian American, intersectional, feminist, and social scientific approaches to biblical interpretation. Oak is an active member of the Society of Biblical Literature, co-chairing the Asian and Asian American Hermeneutic Seminar. She also served on the SBL Status of Women in the Profession Committee and on the Steering Committee for the Minoritized Criticism and Biblical Interpretation section. As a church leader and preacher, Jeanette Oak has more than 20 years of ministry experience. She is an ordained minister who pastors at Echo Church in Orange County, California. Her interdisciplinary interests and ecclesial commitments have shaped her preaching, teaching, and scholarship, giving her a practical focus on church ministry and Christian leadership. Uh, let's warmly welcome Reverend Dr. Jeanette Oak. Thank you all. I'm going to trust that you're really there because I don't see your faces, but it's nice to see you guys in the chat. Uh, I'm going to begin with prayer and then I'll open up the slides. But hello from those who are coming that I know or those who are uh, I don't know, but I'm just glad to be here in the same space together. And for Princeton students, um, this initially was just going to be for you, but uh, it's just wonderful to have other people who are interested to come and join this conversation. So I'm honored to be with you all and to be back um, uh, on my old stomping grounds. So please pray with me. God, you mother us so well. Like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, you desire to gather your people together. So thank you for this opportunity to be and learn together as we come from different places and spaces. Bless us with collective, coalitional wisdom. As we try to connect in creative ways that serve your church, Give us, as Grace Lee Boggs imagines, the limitless capacity to love, to serve, and create for and with each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So there's this one problem I have with my computer. Sometimes my mouth and my image don't match up. Is that happening right now? David, is it okay? I need to hear an amen before I go on. Amen. You're okay? All right. Yes. It can be it can be kind of annoying. No, it's good. It's all good. All right, we're gonna get started. Well, I'm grateful to David Chow and the CAAC for this invitation to speak at PTS at this uh, Asian American student to this student body and all friends who are joining us to, to talk about a topic that I've thought about and wrestled with and lived into for the past 25 years. And so David wanted to open this conversation up to those beyond PTS. And so I'm surprised and delighted that so many of you showed up. It shows that this topic actually has a lot of interest and it resonates with many. And so David asked me today to be a little more informal, to speak from my experiences as much as possible. And so I come to you as a pastor as a preacher and a biblical scholar. I come as a second generation Korean American woman pastor scholar. I come as an Asian American scholar pastor. I come as a mom, a sister, a colleague, a disciple of Jesus who seeks to take my Asian American identity, voice and body seriously in my preaching and to do so in ways that speak to the concrete needs and gifts of my church context, but also beyond my church in ways that reflect the complexities the specificities and pluralities of Asian American Christian experience. And so a little bit more about myself. I'm a pastor at Echo Church in Anaheim, California, or Fullerton, California. And I'm proud to be a part of a pastoral team of six that is made up of three women and three men. We are a Pan-Asian congregation in Southern California, 
and recently celebrated our 13th anniversary of becoming a church together. So I really believe that when we gather like this in spaces, even where I can't see your faces, but I see you in the chat, when we cross-pollinate, when we interrogate, when we congregate and collaborate in these generative and generous spaces, when we do this, we both acknowledge and celebrate the complex diversity among us while recognizing and embracing that there are overlapping experiences that we share as Asian American ministers, scholars, preachers, and leaders. So I just want to acknowledge that there is so much collective wisdom and lived experience right here in this space. A lot of you have been embodying what it means to preach as Asian Americans in your own ways. And so I just recognize that and recognize that about you. So my first conscious memory of preaching as an Asian American came in the person of the Reverend Mary Pack. That's P-A-I-K. Did any of you know her? See, little did I know then that the first Korean American woman ordained in the PCUSA as minister of word and sacrament was serving as the associate pastor for English ministries at my local Korean church in Metro Detroit. It was, I was eight years old when I first saw and heard Reverend Prack preach. And I remember thinking as she raised her hands and gave the benediction, what an awesome boss lady she was. And I also felt, I also felt the spirits moving. And in a Presbyterian context, that's no small thing. So I could see my mom's pride, her, my mother's pride well, swelling in her chest uh, and tears welling up in her eyes when she witnessed this historical ministry, this historic ministry. And so I was eight, so I didn't really grasp the gravity of Reverend Pack's leadership at this young age, but my mother certainly did. And she made it pri a priority to take my brother and me to this English speaking service, this young adult service before our own youth service and her Korean speaking service. That's a lot of services in a day, three at minimum. So during the three years I got to be in the congregation where Mary served, God deposited something in me, an image, a sound, a presence, a person, a Korean American woman that birthed possibility in my imagination and the audacious possibility of thinking, I want to be a pastor when I grow up. So I'm going to show you a picture that Mary so kindly uh, shared with me. So this is a picture of her ordination bulletin, the Reverend Mary Pax ordination bulletin. The Presbytery of Detroit cordially invites you to join in the celebration of the ordination of Mary Pack in the ministry of word uh, in, of the Presbyterian Church USA and has installation as in her installation as associate pastor in Korea, uh, of Korean Presbyterian Church of Metro Detroit. You see that it's in two languages here. And I love this note thing I noticed below that it says reception to follow uh, care for children under four will be provided. I just thought that's kind of remarkable looking at this bulletin because that means that they thought this was a big enough deal to make sure people could come and childcare was provided. So I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just bringing that up here. But look at this picture. This is a picture of Mary, of Reverend Mary Peck on the day of her ordination. What do you notice about this picture? Come on now, light up the chat or talk aloud. Do you notice anything? She's so young. Yes. Thanks, Gloria. Thanks, Bo. Yes, Dr. Car Bo Karen Lee, she was young. Happy. Yes, that same white Jesus picture in the background, Joey. I have, my parents had that too. Probably many churches did. See, David and Wally. Hey, David. Okay, so. Another thing that's pretty remarkable about this, yes, that picture, that picture, uh, whoever made that painting, I forget his name, he, he did make a fortune. But something that Mary told me when preparing for ordination is that she envisioned having her stole made um, in the sectong pattern. So this pattern here is called sectong pattern. And it's uh, her aunt got the fabric from Korea and then her mom sewed it together. 
right? Oh, yes, the colors of her stole. That's what I'm referring to now. And as far as she knows it, she was the first person to do that. And since then, each time a Korean American woman gets ordained in the Peace USA, she receives a sektong stole like this one. Now, you might wonder what sektong means. In Korean, it literally means colorful stripes, but more popularly refers to the sleeves of a traditional girl's hanbok like this one, a traditional Korean dress. You see that you'll see a similar pattern on the sleeves of the sektong um, stole that Mary uh, imagined and her mom and aunt helped make, and in this, the sleeves of this hanbok. But there's more to this, okay? Historically, as far back as the Chosun dynasty, this patchwork technique was used to create this pattern, the sektong pattern, as, as the, uh, the clothing maker would select and join together strip, claws of strip, strips of cloth of multiple hues. And it would reflect her personal creative color expression. Many of the Hamburg designers were women, so I can say that. So think for a second about the symbolism of this stole and Mary's ordination. Mary's aunt, her mom, and Mary herself all had a part in creating this stole for her, the first Korean American woman ordained in the PCUSA. So to me, this sektong stole is a reminder of the ingenuity and creativity involved in this patchwork pattern and in being an Asian American preacher. She was Korean American, she still is, but she also identifies as Asian American. And I'll talk more about that term soon. So part, so I grew up for the first part of my life in Michigan. So if you hear me when I'm really tired, I have this father God, this, this accent, the Midwest accent, you'll hear it once in a while. Okay. But I grew up initially my first part of my life in Michigan, where I found the Korean church to be a place of great comfort and belonging. And I understood myself primarily by my ethnic and religious heritage at that time. I was Korean, I was Christian, and I was American, but in a way that felt different from the white folks and the Jewish and black folks in my community. So when I first moved to Southern California, it was when I was entering the sixth grade and my brother was entering the ninth. And it was then that and I encountered a critical mass of other Asian Americans for the first time. By critical, oh, okay, one second. So by critical, I mean enough for other Asian American students to congregate in one, more than one space around campus. So I'm gonna help my brother out and sektong is S-E-A-K-D-O-N-G. I'll put it in the chat. I think I can. I love this live interaction. So when my family and I moved to Southern California, I was a junior in high school and I had a few awakenings. The first one was that there were other Asian kids out there, which I just mentioned, but not only Korean ones, but Vietnamese, Filipino and Chinese American kids at my school. And it was interesting because I felt this immediate, unspeakable, powerful connection to them, even though we didn't necessarily share the same hobbies or even the same faith traditions. So what was this connection coming from? Why did I feel like I could be myself around them so much more than with other kids? So I remember finding a book that my brother left behind from college. It was called Bone by Fei Min Eng. And it was the beginning of my love for Asian American literature. Has anyone read this book? So I struggled to articulate what it was about books like Eng's Bone and Chang Rain Lee's native speaker or Jessica Hagedorn's dog eaters. Oh, okay, I'll do that. This was the first Asian American um, novel I have ever read and I was in high school. No problem, Naomi. After that, I, I was exposed to more, but what was it about books like this that compelled me? Uh, since many of my life experience didn't necessarily directly mirror those of the protagonists. But I also related to the ineffable experiences and realities that shaped my life and, and was described perhaps best as minor feelings. Kathy Park Hong describes minor feelings as, quote, emotions that are negative, dysphoric, and therefore unintelligenic, 
built from the sediments of everyday racial experience and the irritant of having one's perception of reality constantly questioned or dismissed. So at UCLA, I began to find language for what it means to be Asian American. I majored in the study of religion and minored in English lit. Interestingly, at this secular public university with no Bible department, I discovered that the New, Test that New Testament studies was a thing, was an actual thing. And that through it, I might be able to merge my love for the church, my sense of call for ministry, and my hunger to understand the biblical texts and the world behind them as a New Testament scholar. Like it was this epiphany I had in class. I didn't know if I would get to do it, but the idea dawned on me that it was a possibility. Now UCLA had no religious, uh, had a religious studies program and my NT courses were housed in the history department as early Christian history, uh, as early Christian history courses. And my OT or Hebrew Bible courses were housed in the Near Eastern Langu Ang Languages and Cultures Department. So my friends joke that I kind of made UCLA like a seminary. Uh, but Dr. Scott Barchi's lectures on the historical Jesus and early Christianity, at this time, they really rocked my world. I always wanted to understand the world behind the text and the world behind some of the, 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 uh, uh, the passages that were often uh, thrown at me when I talked about wanting to become a pastor, prohibitive texts uh, for women. So I really found this class to be eye-opening and it was in his classes, I took all of them, and during our conversations at UCLA that I discovered my interest in becoming a New Testament scholar. And also this interdisciplinary social scientific approaches as well. That was kind of early on. And Scott also helped me discover how my love for the church and biblical scholarship could intersect. But it was also at UCLA where I took my first Asian American studies courses. And it was then that in this kind of inchoate but early fledgling form, I began to think about how these courses and my readings were strangely impacting the way I understood myself and the biblical texts. All right, so after college, I became an English teacher at Compton High, Compton High School, which is um, in Los Angeles County. And I never will forget the discussion I had with my students about the LA riots. So in 1992, when the LA riots or the uprising occurred, my students were in diapers and I was in junior high. But not far from the high school where I taught, where we were having this discussion, this discussion was a street where my uncle witnessed two of his beauty supply stores destroyed in the aftermath of the uh, non-guilty verdicts of the officers accused of beating Rodney King. So after our discussion, a student asked me with complete sincerity, Asian Americans are not all Korean? And Asian Americans also face racism? In other words, you're all not the same and aren't all like all good. And so now I'm moving on to Princeton Seminary. When I came to Princeton, I remember buying a shirt from the Women's Center that said on the front, you say I preach like a woman? And on the back it said, I say amen. Did any of you have that shirt? Yvonne, did you buy that shirt? So I found PTS to be a place where I could thrive as a woman minister in training. I was so tired of com compl the complementarian egalitarian debates and wanted a chance to focus my biblical and theological for formation. Oh, Dr. Lee has that shirt. Um, I was so tired of that debate and I wanted to push beyond it and, and focus my theological and biblical formation beyond whether women should be allowed to preach. I actually wanted to be trained in how to preach and interpret the Bible. But I was surprised by something I didn't quite expect. I learned not so much in my classes, but because I found it hard to relate to what I was learning in class to my own life and ministry context, that I was going to have to do some serious work embracing on the one hand and interrogating on the other my Asian American identity. You see, I discovered while studying in the hollowed halls of the historic and renowned institution that racism was structural and could be found in the bones of churches and institutions that we come from, serve in, are a part of. That it's not easily extracted or extricated. 
And the impact of such histories and legacies, they manifest in manifold and often insidious, subtle or cumulative ways. So in my doctoral studies, I was warned by well-meaning people to avoid being pigeonholed in my scholarship by becoming too much of an Asian American biblical scholar. You don't want your books to have too short of a shelf life, I was advised. Or I ran the risk of being branded as, as identitarian, not because all my work explicitly discussed Asian American perspectives, but, uh, well, well, I ran the risk of that, but I was willing to, to, be, to risk it because I always brought that perspective with me and in me. I just couldn't easily uh, take it away or, or extricate it from my work, my thinking. And I didn't always articulate it, but I found that rather than being a resounding gong, that the work I actually did pushed against the erasure of Asian Americans that too often happens in academic and ecclesial discourse around race, racialization, and racism. So it was a challenge because I, I often thought I was crazy or that perhaps these ideas weren't worth uh, uh, exploring. And yet it's something in me decided to press on and to do what I needed to do to get the education I could at PTS, but also to uh, explore adjacent spaces where I could develop my theological and, and hermeneutical um, Asian American identity and approach. I also found that there were different ways to embody the life of scholarship. From Brian Blunt, who was a New Testament professor at the time and who continues to be a mentor. And if you know Brian Blunt, can you give him some love in the chat? He, he deserves some love. But from Dr. Brian Blunt, I learned how to read biblical texts carefully and engage in the art of exegesis while taking my own context and that of my community seriously. Blunt's scholarship reflected the African American ministry context from which he pastored for many years. His preaching and his teaching, they bridged the world of academia with the needs and realities of the local church. So this was such an impact on me because my entry into biblical studies was wanting to know, understand the text, the world of the text and the world behind it. But Blunt helped me also appreciate and, and take seriously the world in front. Gail Yi, Professor Dr. Gail Yi, though never one of my uh, formal professors, was also a significant mentor for me. Not only has she done pioneering work in feminist and intersectional interpretation of the Hebrew Bible, but I learned from Yi of the importance of mentorship, collegiality, sisterhood, and bringing others along for the ride. She has mentored countless students. Give her some love if you have been mentored or touched by her in some way, blessed by her work or her presence. Her commitment uh, to investing in Asian and Asian American women in theology and ministry has influenced multiple generations of leaders, some of whom are in this colloquium right now. So this leads me, yes, yes, amen. Thanks, Milton. This leads me to the question, what does it mean to preach as Asian Americans? I've been talking about it and referring to it, but what does it mean? The theological and hermeneutical task of defining Asian American. Let me just make sure I'm right. Uh, first, I actually want to uh, point to some books that were groundbreaking and charting a path for Asian American biblical interpretation. But actually, I might do that. I might do that in a moment. Um, give me. Yes, let's go here first. So according to an article published by Jerry Park, Joyce Chang, and James Davison, second generation Asian American and Latino evangelicals hold colorblind views most similar to those of white evangelicals. Why? Well, because they are more likely than non-evangelical Christians in their racial communities to attribute the persistence of racial inequalities to personal, not structural or systemic factors, and are less likely to support government policies aimed at increased opportunity and access for, quote, minority groups. So one of the challenges facing Asian American evangelicals, I'm just noting here, is learning how to connect or intersect the personal and the corporate, the individual and the societal dimensions of the gospel, to become more aware of how, to become more aware of and challenge theologies that claim to value diversity but still center whiteness. 
I think we need to be careful not to become allies with those who seek to protect white privilege and to be okay with not being the model minority in, anymore. So just think, how often do we assess whether an Asian Amer American pastor has made it? Usually when he has been invited to speak at a white gathering or is the executive pastor of a predominantly mega white church. I said he on purpose, but. So the ongoing task or the work of defining Asian American and Asian America is not simply a preliminary task that leads to theological reflection. But as my Fuller colleague, Dr. Daniel Lee underscores, it is the theological work itself. It's crucial for understanding how Asian Americans understand and live out the gospel. And I would add, it is the hermeneutical work of Asian American preachers as well to understand what it means to be Asian American. To help, to help understand that identity as we embody and pro proclaim and encourage others to live out the gospel, including fellow Asian Americans. So now I'm gonna to return to that slide here. I'm gonna name um, some books that were groundbreaking in charting a path for Asian American biblical interpretation, which I'm gonna to get to in a moment. But uh, so, so our, I'm not sure if you're familiar with some of these or I hope you are, and I hope that your library has, has them. But this one is actually the Samea volume of in 2002, The Bible in Asian America. Uh, it was edited by Tatsung Benny Liu and Gail Yi. And then in 2006, Ways of Being, Ways of Reading, an edited uh, volume by Mary Foskett and Jeffrey Kwan, they edited it, that was published. And then Tatsung Benny Liu published the first monograph specifically focusing on articulating what is Asian American biblical hermeneutics in 2007. In 2019, Uriah Kim and Sung Ah Yang published a multidisciplinary edited volume called the TNT Clark Handbook of Asian American Biblical Hermeneutics. You see that right below on the right. And Gail Yi just published her book, Towards an Asian American Biblical Hermeneutics, an intersectional anthology in 2021. So what can we say about Asian American identity? Tammy Ho in her chapter in the TNT Clark Handbook, which I just referenced, she underscores that each ethnic subgroup of Asian America has its specific histories, different experiences of exclusion, incorporation, and interracial cultural contact. There is complex diversity in other words. That said, there needs to be a, some sort of strategic essentialism uh, in, that is the mobilization of minoritized or ethnic groups on the basis of shared gendered cultural or political identity to represent themselves. So Asian Americans, amid all their diversity, share experiences and culture with other Asian Americans from other ethnic groups. Tammy Ho goes on to say that immigrants who came to this country had an ethnic sense of being Filipino or Japanese, Indian, Korean, Vietnamese, Hmong, Cambodian, Chinese, Indonesian, etc. However, this ethnic sense cannot be easily separated from each of these subgroups encounters with colonialism in, Asian and changing US, in Asia and changing US immigration and settlement policies. Are you guys following me? Let me give you a slide in case. So the first point I wanna say that what can we actually say about Asian American identity that's not too reductionistic is that Asian American identity is complexly diverse and heterogeneous. Another thing that we can say is that social and legal segregation and the deprival of certain legal rights marked people of Asian descent as perpetually foreign and unassimilable. Let me unpack that a little bit if we have, I, I'm gonna try to go quickly here. But the most blatant form well, actually, a shared experience that Asian Americans often have encountered in the U.S. is exclusion from full participation in the American life based on race. And the most blatant form of this would be the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the first immigration law restricting immigration into the United States purely based on race. It was passed to prevent Chinese immigrants from entering the U.S. And it was ironic because they came in for labor purposes to serve the labor, cheap labor needs of US industrial 
you know, formation, uh, the, the railroads and other things. And so it's ironic that, that, or it's not ironic, but when you're talking about U.S. Im, uh, Asian immigration to the United States, you also have to think about uh, labor needs and laws in this country. I can't go too much into various examples, but another glaring example of this would be obviously the Japanese internment. Right now, I, I mentioned this because you know we just celebrated the, the the anniversary, the 80th anniversary of Japanese internment. But 10 months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, FDR he signed the executive order on February 6, February 19th. Uh, 1942, that, and this is probably not new to, to you, but it led to the forcible, forced removal of some 112,000 Japanese Americans, most of them US citizens from their homes to be relocated in internment camps far away, like in Utah and other parts far from the West Coast. And so what's crazy about this is that, you know, the idea, the argument of, 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 of particularly focusing on Japanese Americans really hinges on the idea of being American. The question, who is American? And what is Asian or what is American identity? And actually, a, uni a University of Connecticut student, Amar Bacha, he pointedly writes in this college essay in a college newspaper that in 1942, that's when America chose to define being American as not being Japanese. And so I just want to make this note, this comment that, you know, uh, FDR signed this executive order that led to the internment over of um, over 100,000 Japanese Americans in 1942. But that narrative of Asian Americans as being not American isn't new. And 80 years later, amid pandemic, Asian Americans are experiencing a surge of racially targeted hate crimes that, again, perpetuate the idea that we are never truly American. So this narrative of Asian Americans as perpetual foreigners isn't new, it's deeply embedded in US history and in the ideology of Christian nationalism. Okay, so another aspect, oh, oh, so this is, I love this picture. And so I was talking about how Asian American identity is complexly diverse and heterogeneous. Despite the plurality and diversity among immigrants of Asian descent, however, one thing they held in common was, like I said, the shared experience of racial discrimination and inequality. And so in the late 60s, in 1968, that's when this activist, Yuchi Ichioka and Emma G, they organized the student, or, uh, the Asian American Political Alliance, AAPA, at, in Berkeley, California. And there they began using the phrase Asian American. So along with fellow activists, they'd witnessed the success of black power, the movement and the civil rights movement and felt communities with Asian roots could benefit from embracing their shared history. And so I say this to explain that the term Asian American emerged in the 1960s as a political panethnic, panethnic collective coalitional identity that was anchored in the common desire for racial and structural equality, empowerment, a united voice and social change and also in resistance to this racialization of Orientals, which was always used to indicate individuals as, of Asian descent as perpetually foreign and unassimilable. So I hope that these are starting to make sense to us now. Give me a sec. So, what is Asian American about biblical hermeneutics? I spent time explaining what this term, umbrella term means in short, but then how does this apply to biblical interpretation? Give me a holla if you guys are okay. All right, thank you, thank you. So some features about Asian American biblical hermeneutics is that it involves the convergence of different fields. It's multi or interdisciplinary. It, it, it particularly involves Asian American studies and biblical studies, but also psychology, uh, but critical race theory, uh, post-colonial studies, et cetera. It is made up of people who are both the object and subject of the work. 
And it's not a, a, a single project, but rather it stimulates multiple projects. So does an Asian American biblical scholar, Lou, uh, Lou asks, engage in Asian American biblical interpretation by virtue of being who she is? Must AABI necessarily, or AB, AABI, I'm, I'm referring to Asian American biblical interpretation, must it necessarily pursue a particular political agenda? And to make matters more complicated, Benny Liu asks, who embodies or represents that description of Asian American? What about people who are biracial or multiracial? What about those who are fifth generation Japanese American or eighth generation Filipino American who no longer speak or know their mother tongue? What about those who live in both Asia and the US as transnationals? When does one from Asia become Asian American? The question of who and or what will always run the risk of being exclusionary and essentialist and attempts to delimit and define will inevitably challenged and contested. And yet I'm gonna try my best to make a case for what I think it could look like. But before I do, I wanna say uh, that uh, among Asian American biblical scholarship produced over the last three years, or uh, not over the last three decades, not three years, Chloe Sun, she discerns common three common themes revolving around the issues and intersections of identity, race, gender, class, liberation, and how one's social location shapes the ways in which one interprets scripture. I'll repeat that again. So Chloe Sun, scholar, Old Testament scholar, she discerns common themes in the last three decades of AABI scholarship, and they revolve around the issues of intersections of identity race, gender, class, liberation, and how one's social location shapes the ways in which one interprets scripture. And so I acknowledge, um, I'm gonna acknowledge that there is, there is no overall consensus of what AABI is, how it's done and who gets to do it. But I wanna offer you my working definition, soon to be published, um, in the New Testament color. Uh, and, and, and I really want to gain your feedback and uh, think about how this applies, not only to biblical interpretation, but to preaching. So pay attention because I'm gonna ask you to engage, okay? So here's my working definition of AABI. Asian American biblical interpretation explicitly and intentionally approaches the Bible, not only by means of exegesis, but through the lens of Asian American experiences and histories of education, immigration, acculturation, racialization, inclusion, exclusion, and multicultural relationality, which are diverse but often overlapping. So it uses the interpretive framework of Asian heritage, migration experience, American culture, racialization, in order to generate further conversation and insights about the meaning and or impact of biblical texts. It often engages in interdisciplinary research and theological, theoretical, and intersectional approaches to reading the Bible. AABI is committed to reading with, for, and about those who have been minoritized due to their Asian identity. So from an Asian American ecclesial church perspective, AABI can do the above in response to the concrete needs of Asian American churches and in ways that reflect the complexities and pluralities of Asian American Christian identity while reading the Bible as scripture. I'm gonna take a sip of water. It's really long. So I'm gonna ask you guys, what do you think about the definition? What does it lack? What is it? Um, uh, nuance, what does it need more of? One, first, what do you think? And if you have opinions about that, go ahead and share it. And secondly, how you think it can be expanded or uh, uh, adapted to apply to Asian American preachers and to preaching? So I'm, I'm literally going to give you a moment to think about this and to respond if you're so brave and willing and generous to do so in the chat or verbally.
Uh, yeah, okay, so can I can I give a specifically Asian American reading of a Bible? I think so. I mean, people have done so. I've done so. I've made attempts to do this myself. Um, uh, in a, there's a piece called Always Ethnic, Never American. Uh, um, shoot, I can't remember the name. Hold on. I, I will find that for you. Um, but yes, there are many, many, like in the TNT Clark handbook of, uh, uh, of biblical hermeneutics, like take a look at that and you'll see multiple examples of um, reading um, a specifically Asian American reading of the biblical text, not just necessary theory, but also yes, uh, first generation immigrants would be included in, in, in the US of course, but yes, needs more time to think. Yes, Latinx students who would also resonate with the definition. I I've had that conversation with some Latinx colleagues as well and, and that, I found that to be so. Okay. Um, lived experiences as being emphasized. Am I including Asian and religions, both non-Christian and indig indigenized? Well, you know, that's, yes, definitely, Yuri, as being part of Asian, Amer um, Asian heritage, for sure. Yes, I'm in including both um, non-Christian and indigenized. Christianity. Generate further conversation. Okay, so how does this include biracial adoptees and Asian Americans? So actually, I'm going to go to that. And you, you um, are leading me to my next point uh, here. So let me thank you for your feedback. I know that it's really hard to respond immediately. Uh, but let's keep thinking about this together and carry on this conversation. So my bad, I guess I don't have a slide for this. Okay, so uh, greater recognition and inclusion of South and Southeast Asian American Christian perspectives in AAVI, as well as intentional mentoring of Asian American students from diverse and multi-racial uh, Asian American backgrounds and Congress, uh, uh, con members of congregations is really important. And there's actually a 2020 study um, by my colleagues um, at Fuller, led by Daniel Lee, who, who talk about the, their findings doing interviews with uh, various students. Um, and so, yes, there is a greater need to recognize um, not only South and Southeast Asian American Christian perspectives, but also to recognizing uh, that uh, efforts are needed to think about how uh, there's uh, adoptees, multiracial Asian Americans, and are they allowed to claim being Asian American? And I would say yes. And I think that starting to really think about what that means and what it looks like to do that is an important conversation to have, to not gatekeep Asian American identity. Um, reference without referentiality. Yes, exactly. The emphasis on experience makes the process elective rather than exclusive. I think that's an important point that Lou makes. Thanks, David, for bringing that up. Okay. And so I just wanted to make that point that the, what's really important is, is to not make this one size fit all approach, right? That it's, like I said, my first point was Asian American identity and Asian American theology and biblical interpretation is complexly diverse and heterogeneous in nature. And so when we only think about it as in light of East Asian perspectives, we are actually really misconstruing the, 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 the diversity of Asian America and Asian Americans. And also it, it's not just about pure bloodlines as if we could even account for that. There's the complexities of adopt, adoption and being multiracial, of being a quarter uh, Filipino, for example. And these are really important work, uh, identity work that we can we need to do. And I think the church can be spaces where this can happen and should happen. Because like I said at the beginning, the task is the theological task of understanding who we are as Asian Americans is essential, is vital in our living out of the gospel. And also we need narrative nuance. We need to tell stories that reflect the complexity of Asian experiences beyond our own personal and communal ones. So there is, for example, narrative scarcity for many Asians living in the South, as Kiati Joshi and Jigna Desai, uh, I hope, I, I think I might have 
pronounce that name. They detail in their book, Asian Americans in Dixie, because yes, they are Asian Americans in Dixie. Or there's so much to learn about Vietnamese migration and experiences in New Orleans, for example. And so narrative nuance and bringing in stories into our, our, our understanding and into the narratives that we bring, I think is so important and there's so much opportunity for that. Are there churches that are doing such work? I hope that we begin to do that work and I'm sure there are some that are. Um, and so I wanna now uh, talk about, is there such a thing as a distinctly Asian American voice and presence at the pulpit? And how do we embody this voice and presence? So first of all, I think that this is an open question. And I was actually privileged to be a part of a thread that was started by Esther Chang. And she uh, asked this question about like from a preaching in her preaching class, is there a tradition, an Asian American preaching tradition that we can even refer to? And that's a really good question. And so I wanna first say that in order to, uh, uh, I think, I think that in order to embody a distinctly Asian American voice and presence at the pulpit, we first begin this by embracing our particularity. So let me show you this picture here. Remember going back to the Reverend Mary Peck. Mary, she created this stole, this idea of the stole, right? When she was getting ordained. And when she did this, she wore her pastoral robes, which is what ministers in the PCUSA often wear. With, with her, she incorporates that with her, the Sekdong style stole that she brings, where she brings her Korean American tradition to bear on her pastoral authority and presence. Now, this is one example of what of the way that she creatively thought of doing this at her ordination and in her ministry. And now in my church, I don't wear robes or usually get to wear stole, but we see that Mary consciously and creatively brought herself to the pastoral role and presence. And mind you, she also wore shorts and t-shirts. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't like she only wore this. But I think that tradition, one of the things that we can't claim is a singular tradition. There's just too much diversity among us but that we have traditions that we can bring and that they can come to bear on how we present ourselves, what we say about ourselves, uh, uh, of the people we address and talk to and, and acknowledging their traditions that they bring. But no, I don't think there is one, but I think that there is a chance to then choose the traditions we want to weave in and bring in to the fore, often are explicitly, but sometimes implicitly. I think it's really important it's, it's important to, to take up more space, to practice taking up more space at the pulpit. And I wanna say this carefully because I don't wanna just emulate whiteness, right? Like take up as much space as, as, as you can and be big and be bold and that, that, that makes you a more authoritative, powerful preacher. I don't wanna say that, but I do think, I do think that especially uh, a lot of the uh, our, our women sisters around here that I think that we do need to push ourselves to experiment and explore how we use our bodies, how we use the skin we're in, our voices, the modulation of our voices, the way we move around the space to experiment with various body gestures, vocal rhythms, sermon formats, it doesn't have to all be the three point sermon, to find something that we feel is true to ourselves and to also grow and mature and develop our approaches to preaching, to be creative. Because in order to find one's voice, one has to practice and use it with trial and error, with, with reflection and feedback. And so I don't have, I wanna, I wanna bring up uh, this book, Finding Our Voice, A Vision for Asian North American Preaching. And I, I believe that Daniel Wong is here in the, in the house. You can, you can holla if you are. And so Daniel uh, Wong and, and Matthew Kim, they're, they're speaking as homileticians. All right, so they have a lot of practical and theoretical um, advice and, and tangible examples of how you can actually do this. But I wanted to say, first of all, one thing I practice personally in my development as a preacher is to not, to not apologize for what and who I'm not, but to, to speak into and to embrace who I am. So I'll be honest, when I'm talking about preaching, I'm not a homiletician. I was a little insecure actually about talking about preaching, having not had 
formal training in homiletics, but I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. I'm a biblical scholar. And I feel like there's something I can share. It's not the end all. It's not conclusive, but it's something that I can share. So I'm learning to not apologize for who I'm not, to take seriously the, the gifts that I bring and the, th that they are assets and sometimes liabilities because we always have to, we have to be critical also of, of some of our assumptions and um, biases. But yes, Finding Our Voice, A Vision for Asian American North Ameri Asian North American Preaching by Drs. Matthew D. Kim and Matthew L. Wong. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Uh, and there are other resources as well. I just wanted to acknowledge. But there's this, this idea of, 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 of preaching teams. It's not exclusive to being Asian American, but I do think the collective, the, the, the collaborative nature of preaching teams can be a way to kind of to break against this, this idea that it has to be one voice, one voice representing the whole congregation or representing God on, on high, that, that when we shape and develop preaching teams, we're also training our congregation to expect to be nourished and to be taught by and to be impacted by multiple voices, not just one. And it takes training, not only of the preacher, but of the congregation to receive and take seriously, not the senior pastor's perspective only. Team preaching. I have not done this before, but like in one sermon, preaching together is another way in which I believe we can experiment with different formats and to recognize even among as Asian Americans, I might come from an East Asian perspective and my and maybe one day Gabe, Pastor Gabriel Katanis and I will get to preach together and, and we can bring in different perspectives and address yet the this, this same audience and recognize the diversity and the, the, uh, the, the, the overlapping that we share. And we embody that in that kind of setting. All right, I'll hold you to that. Oh, okay, nope. <laughs> Narrative preaching. Is, is a powerful way to integrate personal stories, collective wisdom, but also social, political, and historical realities. I'm trying to follow the text and also what I'm saying here. So forgive me if I forget, if I don't comment. So some Asian American preachers will be in an ethnic immigrant or pan-ethnic context. So the opportunity, um, so your you have a different kind of task, you might say. You might have the role of helping con congregants understand and process their Asian heritage, their migration experience, their encounter with American culture, their racialization as they develop in their discipleship. But they may also need to learn how to take that socio-political identity seriously as, a, as because God cares about those contexts and God cares about those realities. But some of you are preaching in multicultural and predominantly white contexts. Would that be true? And so part of the task is nuancing Asian American identity and bringing and telling stories that reflect the complexity of Asian experiences, stories even beyond our own personal and communal ones. Now, I, I, I wanna uh, note something that uh, is, so uh, we have, there's this, like, hold on, I'm gonna show you this link here. I really wanna recommend this, this uh, Daniel Lee wrote an article in Fuller Magazine, and there's a link here that I could share with you as well. I'll put it here, where God meets us, four approaches to Asian American origins and theology. So let me stick that in the chat for you. Because I think it's, it's important to talk about how we, when, when we, we can interweave our personal history, our ethnic history, our racial history and our post-colonial history into the stories we tell in our sermons. And we don't have to do this every single time, but I do think we should think about how we can do this more, that this is something vital for formation and discipleship. And I'm almost done here. But the setong, that pattern I showed you earlier, I'll go back to, that picture of Mary, Mary Peck. The sectong is about we a weaving of colors together to create a unique pattern. It's an artistic style that's an expression of the creator. 
And preaching is about weaving together the theological, the personal, and the sociopolitical. And I, I love the image, and I want to leave you with this image of the sectong because it's about this heterogeneous pattern that make up a whole. And we have to shift and, and transform it depending on the, the location of the speaker and of the congregation. We have to contextualize even our own embodied contexts and our own bodied social location. The preacher, I must humbly admit, cannot speak to everyone's reality at all times. And I think that this, and, and Sujin Ko brought this to my attention, this point, that this particular humility of the Asian preacher is something to be celebrated. I cannot speak to every, every single uh, reality, but I will offer and gesture an invitation to the table and speak to my own, to that of my particular uh, ethnic and also the broader Asian American experience. Because I do think that this is not just for Asian American Christians, it's for all Christians. Just as it's, it's safe to say that studying and understanding Asian American history isn't just for Asian Americans, it's for all Americans. And so I'll end with that and leave us open for some question and answers. Thank you, Jeanette. Let's give her a real and virtual round of applause.